Good to be with you again here at Midweek Manna as we are continuing, uh, coming to a close, of course, very soon here with 1 Timothy. We've learned a lot, haven't we? And we've stayed with this several weeks now, and we are the, the better for it because we have removed this idea that, oh, it says pastoral epistles. I'm not a pastor, so it doesn't apply to me. And we just looked for principles. Of course, there were a few things directed to Timothy himself. There were a few things directed to the role of a, of a shepherd, a pastor. But most of it has spoke volumes to us, hasn't it? And, uh, of course, today is no different. I want you to turn with me to chapter 6. And let's read the first two verses together. Let all who are under a yoke, again, we're speaking of uh, an animal's yoke being around their neck. Uh, All those are under a yoke as bond servants, regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Verse 2, those who have believing masters, must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. So again, uh, oh man, we can just camp out here for a long, long time, but to hit the headline of it, again, a lot of people, if they're just doing a devotional read, would say, "Ah, I'm going to skip over this. I'm going to gloss over this because I'm not a slave. It is true that at the time of this writing, Rome was the superpower of the world. And under Rome's influence, this is a staggering number, there were at least 60 million slaves, slaves throughout the empire. 60 million people who weren't seen as employees. They were seen as slaves. So the verbiage here, the language here, of course, we could say, well, let's just, we're not going to get anything out of this. And that's not true. The principles, once again, carry over. Again, back then, no doubt, there were good masters and there were evil, monster masters. And again, this is a letter written of someone in oversight to a pastor who's going to have people attending his worship services and his prayer meetings and his Bible studies and his cell groups and getting youth groups that are children whose parents are somebody's slave. Going to be members who uh, don't have the flexibility of just coming anytime you pronounce a particular service. Uh, so I'm, I'm having a little, f- little fun with you, but at the same time you realize the responsibility that Paul knew that Timothy was going to have as a pastor that a lot of people that would be one of the kingdom of God are still going to be slaves to somebody else. And so real quickly, the principle that we can deduce from this is uh, if you have a heathen master, well, for us, if you have a, a pure heathen employer, and it gave, he gave instruction that you got to realize it's still upon you to be a good steward of God who just happens to be a slave, who just happens to have an evil master. Then again, you may have a good employer, but not a Christian. I can remember working as a uh, my later teen years in a factory, Square D, they produce electrical equipment, and uh, I went on third shift. 
So I was doing some uh, classes, uh, in college classes, and juggling that with working full-time and doing that third shift thing, the graveyard shift. And because there, was, there wasn't any office personnel in the plant on third shift, there was no real um, oversight from any type of white-collar um, uh, superintendents on the site. You had it broke down to where there was just a skeleton crew there. I, I think most of the time I worked there, there might be uh, 400 people on first shift, 400 people second shift or close to that. Uh, and the third shift, uh, it got as low as 12 of us, uh, sometimes 16, 18. And so uh, I found myself with other Christians working. But I was grossly disappointed in their attitude. Now, of course, I was very young compared to them. They would have been in their 30s and 40s, uh, maybe 50-ish. And here I was, you know, 19, 18, 19 years old. Um, and we would have these discussions. Um, and, uh, I, well, we're just going to read our Bible over here. But, no, I'm on company time. Well, I'm going to but I go over to the restroom and I just I just close the stall door and I might be over there for an hour. They weren't paying you to do Bible study. And this made me real popular. <laughs> but I I just believed in this principle. How in the world was I ever going to have any effect, any positive effect? And the reality is there was my quality control man who was lost, as we say, as last year's Easter egg, involved in so many vices in life. And a year and a half later of, of that relationship, I had the privilege of leading that man to the Lord. And he started attending my church. And amazingly, these other Christians uh, would speak to him because he was their quality control man and said, oh, Rick, you're in church now. Great, well, you need to come to our church. And he was quick to tell him, you wouldn't even wipe your nose on me for the last number of years. And now, now you want me to come to your church? No, I'm going to go where the person who had interest in me, the person, uh, attends church. Yeah, but they're Pentecostal. They're a, little, they're, a little, they're a little out there. Well, maybe it took a little out there to reach someone like me, was his statement. Of course, he called me Mr. Goody Two-Shoes. I, I know, I know. He was deceived at the time. But um, anyhow, we're talking about, you know, employer-employee relationships to this day. You may have a good Christian employer. Don't take advantage of that. And don't expect them to give you favor over someone that's not a Christian that's working for them. Here's the word, folks compartmentalize. If you are hired to do a job, do it and do it well. And this is really what he's coming down to, is to understand that when we talk about in Christ, there's neither male nor female, Jew or Gentile, bond or free. Where it may be true spiritually that there is spiritual equality, that does not efface civil distinctions. And today we're blurring those lines again through the media and, and forgetting how to respect. The Bible says, even in the house of God, we are to honor those who and give respect to those who are over us in the Lord. It actually uses the word be subject to those over us in the Lord. That's where we will give an account, wherever we are in life. How did we serve at the distinctions that were given to us? Did the Scriptures not teach us? Did Jesus not teach us to render to Caesar that which is Caesar's? If you want to be effective, no matter you know where you are in life, if you're still employed, if you're retired, whatever the case, when you when you know how to respect people 
and the titles that they carry. That doesn't mean you have to worship them. It doesn't mean you have to try to manipulate them. It does not mean anything other than, again, we need to be people of wisdom, know how to identify distinction. We need to know how to honor that and to be real, to be real. You know that that's one of my favorite expressions. For me, uh, I'll be very candid with you. I've, I've made kind of one-liners from this from the pulpit, or maybe I've given it a little more than a one-liner. But I will share with you today, being a pastor, being a pastor with preaching responsibility, two things that I never thought as a child, would be a part of my life. As a teenager, feeling the call of God in my life and saying, okay, here I am, Lord, use me, but not behind a pulpit. Uh, And that surrender uh, that I had to go through uh, to accept the responsibility, never feeling worthy enough, qualified enough for the responsibility that I carry today. And um, I still keep that before him. I, I know there are much more gifted people in life, and um, and yet I have to be true to that which I've been called to do. And I'm saying that to you today, is to be real. So for me, when someone comes up, whether it's after a preaching service, or whether it's somebody that meets me in the public, and I have a Marietta City School transportation shirt on, and they don't know that I preach or that I'm a pastor. All they know me as Mr. Randy, the bus driver. Uh, But then they find out that I'm a Christian or they find out that I'm a pastor, a preacher, and they say, man, but you're real. To me, that's music to my ears. That means you just awarded me an opportunity of influence. Now, It may not go far at that time. However, we've identified something. And I know in my heart of hearts that they're watching me closer. Maybe they're hungry. Maybe they've been wounded. Maybe, maybe, maybe. However, if God's going to use me, maybe he can use me because I'm driving a bus, but they also know I'm a Christian or a pastor or both. So I I pass that on to you. Let's go on now and read verses 3 through 5. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. (laughs) I sounded like old Schultz off Hogan's Hero yesteryear. Understands nothing, right? He has an unhealthy craving for controversy, for quarrels. This man, this speaks, and it's speaking to our culture right now. Listen, Listen to this. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Oh, man. We're talking about false teachers again, aren't we? We're talking about false teaching. In the day this letter was written, the most popular thing in that Greco-Roman world, you know, you always say, who who conquered whom? You know, Rome became the next world power after Greece. So the Romans conquered the Greeks. Well, not so fast. Who's the one that Hellenized the world to this day? Who influenced the way people think? It was the Greeks. And in that world, especially with the Greek influence, oh man, 
Everybody that was anybody wanted to at least know somebody <laughs> who was a philosopher. Doesn't that sound esteemed? Doesn't that sound important, influential? You better believe it. And so the church was wide open for influencers. Yep, notice the word I use now. That's what we know today. It's the same attitude, same spirit driving all this. Is, uh, oh, there's a crowd there. That's why churches were wide open. Now, again, it might have been a house church. It might have had 20 people. It might have had 40 people. It may have had 12 people. It may have had eight people. But it's more than one person. And if I can get to this group, get to this group, and and show them how important I am. Oh, I, I've, I've got a stellar vocabulary, you know. I, I have an accelerated uh, uh, vocabulary. And so, of course, they would dig and research and find words that nobody else was using. And, boy, didn't they sound important. I remember a preacher when I was a teenager that was traveling, and, and he it was dynamic. And one of his go-to things that he went to way too many times in a sermon was, my, 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 my. And then he was going to say something. And uh, after church, he would talk to people <clears throat> about that particular evangelist. He wound up pastoring after that, didn't last long, went back to evangelizing because that's what he was. And my, 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 was almost, <laughs> I don't mean this bad, but to me it was like winding up a motorcycle. My, 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 my. And he would, then he would say something. And you'd ask people of church, did you enjoy that? Oh, man, that was good. Man, yeah, that was deep. Well, what did he say? I don't know, but, man, it was deep. <laughs> I was like, okay, my head hurts now. So it's, it's that same thing that Paul's warning Timothy about that we're still dealing with. Today, we don't have philosophers per se. We have TikTok influencers. We have, of course, people now that are extremely pagan, extremely popular, extremely important, uh, has nothing really to say, but they have a name now. And so, oh, I'm going to buy what they're promoting or I'm going to swallow what they're shoveling out. And, and so, again, anytime we can find people, man, I want to influence it. I want my name to be known. I want to look important. And again, look at the wording here in the ESV. Verse 4, he's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. In other words, a big windbag, right? He has an unhealthy craving for controversy. This is what the point I wanted to bring out. See, and that's where we are today. Oh, I, I, I don't want controversy. Oh, yes, they do. Well, who, who who got that stirring going? I don't know who that guy is, but we need to find out. And, and, and quarrels about words. Man, you can't even have a conversation with people because I got to get right in your face and get all red faced and get talking about it. And you just find yourself either cowering or barking back at them. That's exactly what we're talking about. And look what it produces it doesn't produce fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, temperance. No, 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 no. It produces envy. It, provo it produces dissension, slander, evil suspicion. I love verse 5. And constant friction among people who have a depraved mind. Is that not, is that not our culture right now? Yes, it is. So see, the very thing, that's, and that, he's like, wow, pastor. Oh, my gosh. We're, this is a pastoral epistle. I didn't realize that would speak volumes to me. And you see what we're dealing with? And if we're not careful today, I mean, back when I was, again, a young Christian, it, it was denomination fighting denomination. And if, whether you're at a ball game or at a restaurant or at work, well, let's argue about the Word of God. No. Oh, well, we're going to have Bible study together. 
And it's okay to discuss differences. No, they didn't want to discuss. They wanted to argue. Well, today, we're at a fever pitch. This friction. Man, we love it. We're not getting anywhere, but we love it. We thrive on it. Church is boring if we don't have a good tension going on. That, that, that group I work with, man, it's just, no. I, oh, tell me about the gossip. Or let's just talk about how dark the world is all the time. And six more murdered last night. And there was that, blah, 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 blah. And just dissension, div- d- division. Folks, this is a preach. This ought to be speaking to us. We got to pay closer attention to where we are. This false teaching, these influences, these cutthroats, they measured themselves by the numbers of people following them. So, again, the characteristics I just shared with you the conceit, the selfishness, the argumentation, proving their superiority, disturbing the peace, being competitive, all these things, uh, of course. Uh, just bringing division, and that's what we're dealing with today. Let's go on. I, I think we're in position. I, I think we're going to close the letter out today. I mean, I could, I could spend actually several more weeks, but I, I think it's it's smart. Let's go on and, and read verses six through eight. But godliness, but in other, however, godliness with contentment is great gain. That's why I didn't want to divide this to another week. I, let, let, let's get to this. Here, here's the answer for us. We're, we're, we're in this friction time. However, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich They fall into temptation. I went on to verse 9 there. So let me me go ahead and finish 9. Into a snare and into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So again, um, we're seeing here this this word contentment. You know, that's almost a, a bad word in our minds. Uh, well, you're saying I got to settle for less. I want to weigh out my options. That is not what this is saying. This is not what it's saying. It's a frame of mind. Contentment is a frame of mind that is disconnected from this world. Set your mind, set your affections on things above. Uh, Jesus, of course, we know, teaching. We've got it in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added to you. Think not fearfully about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear, what kind of housing. Uh, uh, you know, of course, it, a lot of translations said have no thought. It's, that's why I always interject. It's really saying have no fearful thought about it. We are to be good stewards. We do need to pay our bills. We do need to be providers for our families. You're worse than an infidel if you don't. So this this frame of mind of being uh, independent from things that hold us back, um, that's the secret of happiness. And understand this, Christianity doesn't plead for poverty. That's not what this is saying. Um, we got to understand that that uh, it, it's not asking us all just to be so pitiful and poor. We all understand there's no special virtue uh, that comes as a result of being poor at all. The Bible had extremely wealthy people that were serving the Lord with all their heart. When I served as youth pastor many years ago in Thomaston, Georgia, there was an influential lady in the congregation. She was extremely ultra conservative in every way. And uh, I wasn't making enough salary to talk about. And uh, digging it out, digging a youth group out. And um, found out 
that somebody that I won to the Lord had told me about the nine-hole country club golf course, right? They didn't have 18 holes back then. Um, and that ministers could just pay a greens fee. Well, when I went over and found out $2, I'd go over my day off on Thursday, pay $2, and I got to play a round of golf. I got to play 18 holes. I played the same nine twice. But because it was such a small course, you could not play by yourself uh, unless it was just a really, uh, maybe a cool day. There weren't a lot of people out there. So typically, you knew you were going to get picked up, and they wanted foursomes, threesomes and foursomes to play. This is exactly, I was intentional about it. I wanted to meet people in the community. You know what I found out? I found people in the community that also wanted to get connected in the community. Man, it was perfect. The Holy Spirit had directed me there. I had more wisdom than I realized. It's because he was instilling it in me. And I got to share life with them. And We weren't talking about who had uh, six cars in their garage back home. We knew better than that. Well, the little lady at church, she let me know I was going straight to hell. Because I also influenced her son, who was our minister of music, and my pastor. And they would go down at whatever time they wanted to go. Here's where my point is. She came to me. I said, well, what, give me chapter and verse why I'm so wrong. And I won't make fun of her, but she, she had a lisp and talked so slow. And she basically let me know that we're Church of God. And the Church of God doesn't have any rich people in it that we strictly would reach, at best, the middle income. And primarily, we were the lower income, and, and we had to have a heart for the, for the very poor. I said, would you please tell me what book you read that in? Because it wasn't the Bible. So understand from this text, what Paul is instructing Timothy is, he's not saying there's a special virtue in being poor, no. And he's not saying that we're pleading for all of our believers to be poor. That is not what is being said here at all. We are to be content. It's a state of mind. This is good preaching right now. Amen, Brother Randy, you're on it. No, it's, it's the Word of God. Contentment with godliness is great gain. If you're in a season of life, of influence, and, and you've sown well, and you're reaping the harvest, if God is giving you favor, if he's pouring out his blessings on you from the windows of heaven, enjoy it. If you're in a season where uh, it's the winter and it doesn't look like much is going on, just know that, yeah, but I'm content in my heart. I've got food to eat. I've got shelter over my head. God is providing for me. Let's go on. Verses... Uh, Nine and ten, because you can see I could I could stay there longer, but I wanted us to realize that this was a continuation, finishing out this letter, that he wasn't just saying these false teachers and and let's let's give it up. He's talking to us. You're going to see this. You're going to deal with this. But for us, the the impetus in us, the thing that motivates us, is we are to be content. Verse ten said, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Again, probably the most misquoted scripture in all the word of God, right? How many times have you said it? How many times has someone else said, well, the uh, uh, money's the root of all evil? Money, money, money. No, it says the love of money is the root of all evil, of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced himself with many pangs. So again, that selfishness, the love of money, it incubates, it spawns. It's that insatiable thirst. It's that blind ambition. Uh, it's founded on the illusion of money. If I have enough money, I'll have security. If I have money, I'll, I'll know what real genuine love is. No, nah, that's just an illusion. I'll be really happy. I, I, man, you let me get that raise. You let me win that jackpot. You let me win that lottery. I'll finally be happy. It's all an illusion. So it teaches a man 
how to be selfish. Isn't that sad? It's actually the teacher. And it teaches us, and here's the wording here, that, that, <laughs> that we can justify any means by the end we finally, I uh, know, no. It's ill-gotten gain. So we can see that we're still, we're still wide open for false teachers, for apostasy. We're still wide open as church people to, you know, be influenced. Contentment. Look, let's finish the letter out. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness. There's actually an order there. Remember, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll add these other things to you. So you, you go with righteousness and then godliness and faith and fidelity. Love, that agape love. And, and, then, and then patience, that, that victorious endurance. And I'm going to throw a word, my own word in there, balance. So again, uh, let's read verse 11 again. That is for you, O man of God, flee these things, but pursue righteousness. And then godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who is his testimony before Pontius Pilate, made a good confession to keep the commandment unstained and flee, and excuse me, free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in approachable light, I love this, whom no one has ever seen nor can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves in heaven as good foundation for the future, so that they might take hold of that which is truly life. Timothy, guard the deposit, I love that, entrusted in you, Avoid the irreverent babble, whoo, amen, and contradictions of what is falsely known as knowledge or called knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. And he finishes with, grace be to you. So as we close out this study and close out this letter, I wanted to end on a crescendo like that intentionally. And that's why I thought, well, I, I will go ahead and finish out this time, the next time together, we'll pick up with 2 Timothy, the letter 2 Timothy. But as we crescendoed with this, what, what he was showing is, and I, and I did that purposely today, it's easy to focus on the friction today, the division today, to just be consumed by all that. That's why I took the time. But he came in with contentment, and then to see where it takes us. We know the fruit that the friction produces. That's not the fruit we want in our life. So focus upon him and his word. Be disciplined. And it all begins right there. As a man thinketh, as a person thinketh, so they become. Let your mind be stayed. Have the mind of Christ. Focus on that which is above. That does not mean we're not going to contend for the faith. That doesn't mean we're going to deal with anything here that, that upsets us, but we've got to be able to regroup. And the only way we can do that is, I'm content. I am content. I am content. 
Because if it's all good today, to God be the glory. And if it all falls apart, I'm still good. Don't you love that? Let's pray together. We thank you for the study, O Lord. And as we finished out here, we just focused again upon you, the hope of glory, Lord Jesus. Our focus is not to be here on earth. We have to deal with here. But we're just passing through anyhow. So let us make a difference while we're passing through. Let us have influence. And the only way we can do that is to be balanced, content, walking in paths of righteousness, staying focused upon your glory. That is our desire. We thank you for the influence of this letter. We thank you for the anointing that's upon it. We thank you that it's still changing lives today, namely us today. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, next time we'll be in 2 Timothy together. I trust you've enjoyed this study. I trust you've enjoyed today's study. God bless you.